Physiology of hearing seems a bit complicated, but with a thorough knowledge of anatomy of the ear, it becomes very simple. So what happens? How we hear? The pinna uh, collect the sound signals, okay, and it is transmitted to the external auditory canal. And it causes vibrations of the uh, tympanic membrane. And these vibrations will go through the malleus incustates, uh, that is the ossicular assembly. And what is here? That is a stapes. So this stapes foot plate is vibrated. And this is the inner ear, uh, scalar vestibule, scalar tympani and scalar media. So there are uh, fluid system in the inner ear. So this causes the vibration of the foot plate of stapes will cause vibrations in the uh, perilymph. So that is vibrated. And what is this? This is the organ of corti. These vibrations of the inner ear will cause uh, movement of the basilar membrane. So this mechanical sound energy is transduced to electrical impulses. And this electrical impulses will go through the auditory nerve into the uh, cort uh, to the uh, <clears throat> brain right so uh, before going to that how we a sound signal is uh, produced how a sound is produced what happens here so uh, when I clap my hand when I clap you hear the sound and how it is a sound signal is produced so uh, when I clap there is immediately near to that, uh, there are particles in this air. This is a medium, here the medium is air. This medium can be solid or it can be liquids. Okay. So, the clapping causes, this is a, a air particles are here. This causes the particles in the air particles in the immediate vicinity to vibrate. So it will vibrate back and forth and this causes vibration of the next air particle, next air particle, like that it goes. And this back and forth motion of the air particle causes sound, right? So there is compression and rarefaction of the uh, particles in the air medium. Okay? And this back and forth motion of the air particle is called the uh, frequency, right? So one is frequency. Otherwise we call it as a pitch. Frequency is called pitch. We measure it just like pitch. So the pitch of sound. High pitched noise, low pitched voice, isn't it? So this uh, number of cycles per second is a frequency and it is measured by what heads. So one cycle per second is 1 hertz. So the measuring unit for frequency is hertz, right? Like that, this movement, the intensity of the motion can also be measured. So one is frequency and second one is intensity. And this uh, intensity is measured by two methods. Intensity or otherwise called the loudness. Okay, frequency is pitch and the intensity is loudness. That is, from the baseline, how much it goes. So, this strength of the uh, back and forth motion. That is the intensity or loudness. This intensity or the loudness can also be measured by two methods. One is by the amplitude of this particle motion. Amplitude, right? So, one method is amplitude. Amplitude, uh, it is measured in watts. And this is usually used in uh, sound system and in uh, music theatres. Right? But in audiology, we use another terminology. That is a sound pressure. That is my sound pressure. 
the human auditory system is sensitive to a very wide range of uh, sound pressure from a whispering voice to that of a jet engine which is around 10,000 uh, 10, times the sound pressure and along with this the human ear can also discriminate the minute variations in the sound pressure. So what is the measure of sound pressure? The uh, sound pressure uh, system was first used in uh, telephone by Alexander Graham Bell. Actually he invented this uh, method of finding out the loudness or the intensity. So this measure of sound pressure is in bell, right? It is in bell. After Alexander Graham Bell. And since the human ear can discriminate even a minute change in minute fractions of sound pressure, actually we need a logarithmic scale to measure that. Right? So we use decibel. Okay, that is dB. This one. And actually, one uh, decibel is one tenth of a bell. Okay, hope you got it. So, I said about frequency or the pitch. And the unit is heads. And intensity or the loudness. And the measure is dB. Different types of speech has got different intensity. Our whispering uh, has got around 30 dB intensity or loudness. And the normal conversation, this conversation is around 60 dB, 60. And when we have an intensity of more than 140 dB, uh, loud sounds will cause pain in the ear. So there is a maximum tolerable limit also. Whispering around 30 dB, a normal conversation, the loudness or the intensity is around 60 dB. The physiology of hearing uh, can be broadly divided into three parts. One is the conduction of this uh, mechanical sound energy played by the external ear as well as the middle ear. And second, transduction of this sound energy into electrical impulses played by the inner ear, um, this organ of corti. And third is the conduction of this electrical impulses into the brain via the neural pathway. So this is actually a teamwork and each part of the ear plays their role to the maximum. Now we can see the role of each part in detail, right? So I said up to this is the conduction of the sound energy. So what is the role of pinna? Pinna, actually this pinna is shaped from here, it is shaped like a horn. Isn't it? Like a megaphone. It is a shape. So, there are three parts. This is external auditory canal and this is the uh, cartilage. Especially the congal cartilage. This. This congal cartilage is shaped like a megaphone. Okay. So, uh, what are the functions of this pinna? One is that it uh, collects the sound energy. So one is collection. It collects the sound at an arc of 135 degrees. Okay. So its sound signals are collected by the pinna. And second is localization. Isn't it? We can localize the uh, origin of the sound from where it is coming. And between the two uh, pinna, what is there? It is a head, head is there. So there is a shadowing effect of the head also. So when I am hearing from this side and a sound is coming from other side, I can know from it is coming from my right side or it is coming from my left side. How it is that? If the sound is produced here, it causes much uh, vibration, much more uh, vibrations and also it reaches the ear fast. And when the sound is produced on, on my left side uh, far away, it has to come around my head into this right ear. So there will be, the intensity will be low compared to the nearest sound and also the uh, delay in reaching the sound. 
both this okay so uh, pinna can localize the origin of sound and third is concentration what concentration that is i said this conical cartilage acts as a megaphone and it collects the sound and it uh, concentrates it at the entry point of the external auditory canal right so that is a concentration together by this the pinna gives around 6 db increase in the intensity of sound right by collecting localizing and concentrating into the entry of the external auditory canal pinna has a role pinna increases around 6 db intensity right and what is the role of this uh, external auditory canal external auditory canal I, uh, you know it is an s shaped tube and one end is closed by the tympanic membrane so the sound signals coming here will vi uh, uh, hit and vibrate on the uh, walls of this uh, canal and actually this external auditory canal will act as a resonating tube right so uh, it causes an increase in the intensity by around 15 to 22 db okay and mainly in a uh, frequency range of 2 to 7 kilohertz right so this is the together around 25 db is the external ear gain right so when the sound signal uh, pinna collect localize and concentrate it and this external auditory canal acts as a resonating tube and the external ear gain is around 25 db especially at a frequency range of 2 to 7 kilohertz okay sound signals will reach the tympanic membrane and this tympanic membrane is set into vibration and for the tympanic membrane to uh, vibrate properly the air pressure on both side outside and inner side of the tympanic membrane should be equal you must have noticed a uh, ear block while you are in an elevator ride or in an a diving or in when you uh, ascend or descend in an aeroplane isn't it that is because of the uh, disturbance in the air pressure because of the eustachian tube and in a eustachian tube dysfunction there will be severe uh, discomfort in the uh, middle ear and also there will be a conductive hearing loss okay and one more thing this tympanic membrane vibration is more in the periphery if you this is a uh, center part and if you take the tympanic membrane like this here the vibrations will be more in the peripheral part and it will be less in the central part because of the handle of malleus and the ambo this tympanic membrane vibrate more in the peripheral part okay hope you understood up to this part so the pinna external auditory canal is resonating to you and vibrations of the tympanic membrane and this is the middle ear part and this is the inner ear part what is there in the middle ear it is a air which is in the middle ear and what is there in the uh, inner ear it is a fluid so the sound waves are traveling from a air medium into a fluid medium uh, imagine you are running in your playground you have run you can run a reasonably uh, fast and imagine you are running under water what happens even if all other condition you are breathing everything is okay your air uh, oxygen supply is okay you won't be able to run that much faster under water sometimes you won't be able to move a bit why because the fluid offers much resistance so one another word is impedance impedance means resistance right so the impedance is more in a uh, fluid or the impedance increases when the density increases okay so that is resistance or the impedance so if the uh, sound 
directly comes here. This is air and this is uh, water. So what happens? The sound, if the sound is coming directly and it is hitting the cochlear wall, only one percentage or the uh, one percentage of this will go inside. This one percentage. The rest, 99 percentage, will not reach. What happened to that? It will reflect back. Right? Because of the high density or the high impedance in the inner ear fluid. This will reflect back. So, our middle ear has made a uh, uh, system that is an impedance matching. This impedance mismatch is corrected at the middle ear level by some mechanisms. And this middle ear acts as an impedance matching device or the transforming device. So, impedance matching, otherwise called transforming action, right? So, what happens? How the middle ear matches the impedance? Let us see. The middle ear converts sound of uh, greater amplitude and lesser force to that of a lesser amplitude but greater force. Force is more. Force should be more to travel in a medium having a high density. So, lesser force sound uh, waves are con uh, converted into a greater force uh, waves. And the middle ear does it by two mechanisms. One is a hydraulic action of the uh, tympanic membrane and another one is by the liver action of the ossicles. Yes. Hydraulic action of the tympanic membrane. You know the tympanic membrane, what is the surface area of the uh, tympanic membrane? It is around the 60 mm square. The total surface area of the tympanic membrane is 60 mm square. And that of the uh, stepidia foot plate comes to around 3.2 mm square. Here it is 3.2. So 60 and 3.2. Right? But this is the total surface area of the tympanic membrane. And that the total part will not move. So, the effective vibratory surface area comes to around 45. Right? So, the effective uh, vibratory surface area comes to around 45 uh, millimeter square. So, what will be the uh, ratio between these two? The tympanic membrane is a larger surface area compared to that of the um, stepidia foot plate. Okay. So, the sound waves which is having a uh, causing a smaller movement on this larger area is converted into a higher movement on a smaller area. So what will be the ratio between this 45 divided by 3.2 and that comes to around 40 is to 1. Okay. So that is the hydraulic action of the tympanic membrane. That is 14 is to 1. You understood? That is the um, movement which is smaller movement on a larger area is converted into a larger movement on a smaller area. This uh, signals are converted to this. So the effective vibratory surface area of the tympanic membrane is 45 and that of the stepidia foot plate is 3.2. So by dividing you will get a uh, value of 14 and this 14 is the hydraulic action of the tympanic membrane that much force is given to the, the movement of the step video foot plate that that is one method by which the middle ear matches the impedance okay second is the liver action of, of the ossicle Okay, what is that? This is an ossicle and there is an imaginary axis of rotation. Okay, this is an imaginary axis of rotation and that is an, uh, the axis of rotation is an imaginary line passing through the 
anterior malleolar ligament. This is the anterior process. So anterior malleolar ligament and also the incudal ligament. So there is an imaginary line passing through the anterior malleolar ligament and the incudal ligament. It is the axis of rotation. And this uh, handle of malleus. Okay, this handle of malleus is 1.3 times longer than the long prosophagus here. So this is the center and this handle of malleus is 1.3 times longer than the long prosophagus. So on an axis of rotation this ossicles will move. So there will be a lever action of 1.3. Okay, you got it. That is the handle of malleus is 1.3 times uh, longer than the long prosophagus, and both these act a lever action around an axis of rotation. This is the axis of rotation, and that is an imaginary line passing through the anterior malleolar ligament and the incudal ligament. Okay, and the lever action is 1.3 times. What happens here? Because of the lever action, the Displacement of the states is reduced, but the force is increased. Okay, here the force is increased and the displacement is decreased. So, uh, what will be the total transformer uh, ratio? The total transformer ratio equal to 14 into 1.3. Okay. corresponds to 18 is to 1. So this is the total transformer ratio. Right? That is 18 is to 1. So what happened? There is a uh, low pressure high displacement waves are converted into a high pressure low displacement waves. 30 dB increase. Uh, 25 to 30 dB increase in the sound energy reaching to the cochlea. So this is how this impedance mismatch is corrected by the middle ear. That is why the hydraulic action of tympanic membrane and the lever action of ossicles mainly and also by the curved membrane effect and the action of ossicles. Right? Along with this, there is also a phase differential between the oval window and the round window. Sound vibration uh, reaching the oval window uh, if it reaches, uh, the oval window will go for a phase of compression. So these waves will come here and the perilip is at a constant volume. Okay. So this wave of compression will transmit here and this oval window bulges out or it goes for a phase of rarefaction. This should happen. So there will be these uh, sound waves should not reach these both windows simultaneously. What will happen if they uh, reach both windows simultaneously? They will cancel, uh, cancel each other or it will be, waves will be nullified. The energy will be nullified. So, always there is a preferential uh, transmission of energy into the oval window. And in a normal tympanic membrane and a normal middle ear, there is a cushion of air around this round window. So, the sound will not reach there. Right? And if at, due to any problem, this middle ear mechanism is uh, at fault or the middle ear mechanism is destroyed, this transformer mechanism is destroyed, there will be a block in the low frequency sounds. Remember, the middle ear uh, mechanism fault will cause a low frequency hearing loss in the patient. Okay, so you have to remember the impedance matching mechanism and the gain of 14 into 1 point that is 18.1 and that is a total transformer ratio and also the uh, phase differential between the oval window and the round window. Right? And certain natural frequencies will pass through certain areas of the ear more easily. Okay, that is called the natural resonance of that area. Of here, of the uh, external auditory canal, it is around 3000 to 6000 hertz. So this is the natural resonance 
of the external auditory canal 3000 to 6000 hertz and for the tympanic membrane it is around 800 to 1600 hertz so uh, sound waves of this frequency will pass through this area more easily right and for the ossicular chain it is around 500 to 2000 and for the middle ear as such it is 800 hertz so this is a natural resonance of this area for external auditory canal it is uh, 3000 to 6000 hertz for the tympanic membrane comes to around 800 to 1600 and for the ossicle 500 to 2000 hertz and for the middle ear it is uh, 800 hertz and so on an average 500 to 3000 hertz we pass through this uh, external ear and the middle ear more easily and that is the speech frequency it comes to in between uh, 500 to 500 to 3000 ok 500 to 3000 hertz and that comes under speech frequency right so the sound vibrations has reached up to the um, steps footplate so we have talked about the um, impedance and how the middle ear act as an impedance matching device and also the transformer ratio of 18 is to 1 along with the phase differential between the oval window and round window which again contribute around 6 dB uh, force to the sound pressure right now it has reached up to the fluid medium the transduction means conversion of sound mechanical sound energy into electrical impulses so when this step medial foot plate moves back and forth what is here there is a perilymph so a wave of current or wave of motion passes through the perilymph and what is situated here that is a basement membrane so along with the motion of the perilymph this basement membrane also moves what is there inside the attached to the basement membrane is the organ of cotton so when the basement membrane moves back and forth this organ of cotton also moves up and down so there is a tectorial membrane and also the reticular lamina so the movement of the uh, basement membrane causes a shearing action between the tectorial membrane and the reticular lamina and there are the inner hair cells and there are the outer hair cells And the movement of the uh, hair, uh, stereocilia situated on the hair cell, mainly on the outer hair cell, they are embedded within the tectorial membrane. And when there is a sharing action in the uh, tectorial membrane, the cilia will also move. So, on moving, on the phase of excitation, the gen tight junctions in the cilia are opened. So, there is opening of the channels. If it is opened, what is there inside? This is bathed in the endolymph. So endolymph is positive potential. More of potassium and uh, calcium is there in the endolymph. So this will and the uh, hair cells having a negative uh, uh, negative uh, volt. That is around outer hair cells are around minus 75 millivolt and the inner hair cells are around minus 45 millivolts. So when the ion channels are opened and positive current from the endolymph will flow into the hair cells. So what happened? An electrical signal is produced there. And these signals will pass through the auditory now. Okay? Of this, the inner hair cells are mainly concerned with the transforming the or transferring the information about the movement of the basement membrane to the auditory now. We already studied that the inner hair cell, cilia of the inner hair cell will not reach up to the tectorial membrane. They are not embedded in the tectorial membrane. So the main function, it has got so many nerve terminals. 
Through this nerve terminals, the inner hair cell mainly transfer the information that there is the base membrane is moving, base membrane is moving. They will tell into the auditory now. The uh, outer hair cells contain a protein called prestin. And because of this uh, protein, this um, microcilia will contract as well as elongate when stimulated by sound. So because, the, uh, because of that, this uh, outer hair cells are responsible for amplification of the sound signals produced by the inner hair cell and the sharpening of the sound signal and also production of uh, cochlear microphonics and also the autoacoustic emissions. Cochlear microphonics and autoacoustic emissions. And what is this cochlear microphonics? Cochlear microphonics is actually an alternating current potential produced by the outer hair cells. And there are two types of cochlear microphonics. Microphonics 1 and 2. Uh, microphonics 1 is very much depend on the oxygen. And they will be absent if there is lack of oxygen and also by the depth of the person. But the cochlear microphonics 2 is independent of the oxygen. So even after hours after death of a person, this uh, second cochlear microphonics can be recorded. Okay, our cochlea has got extreme sensitivity to sound. And this basis of this extreme sensitivity is the mechanical traveling wave produced in the cochlea. And this was hypothesized or proposed by Von Bekasi. So, this, this is important, the traveling wave theory by Von Bekasi. Theory by Von Bekasi. What is that? You know, this is the uh, your cochlea. Right? The movement of the uh, perilymph causes a wave pattern in the basement membrane, isn't it? So, this wave will travel along the basement membrane from the base towards the apex. Right? This is the base and this is the apex. So, this sound frequencies. Frequencies of the sound will travel as waves, isn't it? And the, all the sound frequency will not uh, travel from the base to the apex. And uh, each part of the uh, base membrane has got a particular frequency level and that is called the natural resonant frequency. Right? So the base, towards the base, there is higher frequencies. The natural resonant frequency is more and towards the apex, there are lower frequencies. So say here it is 20,000. Here it become 10,000. Then 5,000. Like that. Here it become 400. Right? And towards the apex it become lower frequencies. Okay. So each wave when reaches its natural resonant frequency 20,000. No, 2000, it is 20,000. 10,000. So, towards the base, the natural resonant frequency is more. That is, higher frequencies are seen to, uh, towards the base of the cochlea and lower frequencies travel towards the apex of the cochlea. So, when a uh, frequency or a sound frequency tell a frequency of uh, 20,000, plus 5000 okay in frequency range of 20000 and 5000 it will travels into the uh, cochlea so when the 20000 reaches the its natural frequency it will stop there it reaches its highest amplitude and then it dies there but the 5000 will go will go around this and will reach up to the frequency of that area so each frequency has got a particular area in the base membrane and the uh, frequencies are traveling as waves along the cochlea and when it reaches its 
uh, that wave's natural frequency, it will stop there and only the uh, further movement will be of different frequencies. Right? So that is the traveling wave theory of von Bekasi. So each frequency has got its natural resonating area in the cochlea. And this mapping in the cochlea is called the inotopic gradient in the cochlea. It is the inotopic gradient. Okay? Right? That is the traveling wave theory of von Bekasi can be asked in uh, exam. Okay. And uh, all these mechanisms will excite the auditory now. After that what happens? And what is the auditory pathway? What is that? From the uh, eighth now. From the eighth now. Where does it go? From here. Here is the eighth now. We uh, will receive the electrical impulses from here. And from the eighth now, it will go to the uh, cochlear nuclei. Okay, nucleus of the cochlea now. Nucleus of same side and also to the opposite side. Okay, and from there it will go to the olivary complex, superior olivary nucleus. To the superior olivary nucleus, right? And from there it will go to the lateral lemniscus. Okay, it will go to the lateral lemniscus and from there to the inferior cordibulus. Inferior colliculus and then where to the medial geniculate body. And from the medial geniculate body it will go to the auditory cortex. Auditory cortex is in the uh, temporal lobe, it is in the superior temporal gyrus and the broad man's area 41. So, 8th nerve, cochlear nucleus, superior olivary uh, complex, then to the lateral lemniscus, then to the inferior colliculus, then to the medial geniculate body and also to the auditory cortex of the same side as well as to the opposite side. This is a Mnemonics, Echolima. You can remember by the uh, word. So the eighth nerve, nucle uh, eighth nerve to the cochlear nucleus, both dorsal and ventral, olivary complex, superior olivary nucleus, lateral lemniscus, inferior colliculus, medial geniculate body, and to the auditory cortex. So it traces the auditory cortex and the sound is perceived. Okay.